be delayed. So I was uh, trying to wait a few minutes for her, but I haven't heard back from her. So we're going to go ahead and get started if everyone's ready. Good afternoon. The meeting of the Policy Review Committee for June 17th, 2019 will come to order. Welcome. The first agenda item is approval of the minutes. The live video footage of the May 17th, 2019 meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. The next item is number two, unfinished business. Prior to this afternoon's meeting, staff provided to the committee an overview of the comments received on policies 1270, 3720, 4104, and 6202. Are there any corrections, additions, or modifications to these policies based on the comments received? From any board members? Okay, thank you. Hearing none, these policies will be moved forward for third reader on July 9th, 2019. The next item is policy 5110, admissions. And for that, we ask Dr. Adams and Dr. Nieve to come forward. Based on comments received from Mr. Offerman at our May meeting, the committee voted to postpone the policy and revisit it again in June. And so now we are um, going to hear from uh, Dr. Nieve and Dr. Adams. Sure. Um, good afternoon, committee, me committee members. Um, Dr. Nieves and I met, as you know, um, when Mr. Offerman, you had the questions around um, how do we communicate to parents any recourse they might have should they disagree with the principal's decision around the grade placement. And so um, at the last meeting, um, as I was sitting, I thought perhaps we needed to compare this policy to our promotion and retention policy, which does lay out an appeals process, knowing that um, a, a, an appeals process around retention you know, can take several weeks, and we couldn't do that with this kind of um, thing in terms of getting students enrolled in schools. And so since then, um, we, we started with that as an idea, Dr. Nieves and I, and then we um, had some time to talk with Ms. Clark in the law office, and we're requesting a little more time. We wanted to investigate um, the interstate compact article of Comar a little bit more to see if that can give us some guidance around what language we might be able to add to the rule in order to strengthen and communicate clearly to parents, and we just need a little bit more time to dig into that if that would be okay. So the question is on the postponement of policy 5110 until the fall. Do I have a motion to postpone policy 5110 until the fall? I, I moved for that. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there a second? Second. Second, Ms. Pasture. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the motion carries unanimously. So policy 5110 will be placed on the agenda for the fall. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The next order of business is new business, and we have policy 3210, purchasing guidelines. And for that, uh, we have presenting today Mr. Smith and Mr. Saris. But I see Mr. Saris and Ms. Barbara Burnop. So welcome. Good afternoon. We Good afternoon. have uh, 3210, I believe, is the first of three uh, policies. Um, and we're recommending uh, conf changes to conform to uh, the board's uh, standard language. Uh, to encourage the use of sustainable procurement practices as recommended by uh, National Institute of Government Procurement um, and uh, remove outdated or unnecessary language. Thank you. Is there any discussion from board members? Ms. Rowe? Is there anything in these three policies or any other policy that would um, 
provide for implementing recommendations made by legislative audits to the procurement process? Um, no. Uh, the policies are designed around uh, what's in state law and, and uh, the procurement sections uh, of the educational article section five and section seven that relate to us, which are I'm pretty sure they're cited here. Um, in the actual findings, they recommend changes to the procedures, but not changes to the policies. So should it be in the policy, I guess it's directed at board members, should it be in the policy that when a legislative audit makes recommendations to the procedures that the school system should institute those recommendations? Ms. Howie has comments. Well, uh, I seem to recall that the legislative audit before this last one, and I'm, I'm blanking on the year, did recommend that, I'm sorry? 2015. I think it was prior to that. What was, which was the one prior to 2009? Yeah. So that sounds about right. So that particular year, uh, the legislative audit report recommended that procurement agents be included in the ethics code policy as individuals required to file a financial disclosure. So they did uh, recommend a specific change to board policy, but to indicate without knowing what the possible uh, changes would be that there's a blanket, um, a blank check, so to speak, I'm not sure if that's a wise way to, or the wisest way to amend policy, because you're not, it's not clear what you're asking staff to do or what you're telling the public you are going to do. I guess one of the things I've noticed in reading the legislative audits is that sometimes the language of the legislative audit um, repeats itself one audit to the next in its recommendations to the county, and in some cases I don't see a response from anyone as to why those recommendations are not being followed and our own external audit brought up some of the same issues. And I'm wondering where in our board policy does it address the issue of when a legislative audit recommends for the school system to do something, how does the board direct the school system to do something that comes out in a legislative audit? Do we wait for the audit and then tell them? But if it's if we're driving everything we do by policy, how is that reflected in our policy? And I'm not sure there is an explicit policy that indicates thou shalt implement every legislative audit recommendation. I do not believe that that is explicit in board policy. I think what we, <clears throat> a thought that that I had to answer your question is that the policy review committee could ask our staff to review the legislative audit reports from 2009 and 2015 and see if there are recommendations that would should be considered as changes to policies. So I'd like to make a motion to do that then because I think we're before we proceed with these three policies that address those specific things would probably be a good idea. Ms. Clark, did you capture my suggestion that Ms. Rowe would like to make a, has, yes, why don't you restate the motion? I move that we request that the school system review the 2009 and 2014 legislative audit to see if any of the recommendations in the legislative audit are applicable to these three policies. Would you consider a friendly amendment to evaluate if they should be reflected in any policies? Yes. So you made the motion. I'll second it. Is there other discussion? No. 
no other discussion, then I would say um, all those that are in favor of Ms. Rowe's motion say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. So would it then? So then the next item would be to postpone right. the three. next three policies, 3210, 3215, and 3250, pursuant to the evaluation by Miss um, Howie and her staff. So moved. Is there a second? Second. I'd like to hear from Mr. Saris if um, that would alter any timeline for purchasing or have any no um, I just want to note that I think when mrs. Rowe referred to the external audit you meant the procure the recent procurement audit yes. okay um, and I can assure you that our goal has been to work diligently to implement all of the recommendations we haven't found any that I can that I can remember. I can't speak specifically about 2009, but in both for both the procurement audit and the 2015 legislative audit, our goal has been to implement all the recommendations. So, um, and we can certainly, as we talked about last month, uh, report to this committee and to the board our progress along those lines. So we certainly have no concerns that adding this language or deferring this uh, action today is going to change anything that that we're doing okay that's good to hear so miss Rowe, the the motion that you made and passed reflected the legislative audits of 2009 and it was done in 14 the, and the report the, was dated yeah. 2015. Um, Mr. Saris had a good point of the UHY report. Would you want to make a motion about having them review those recommendations? So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Okay. Because um, certainly it makes sense if you're looking at them to look at all the pieces of the puzzle and see if there's any improvements that need to be made. Um, and I think. Uh, from last year, maybe it's 3231, which was a policy on the qualification of vendors that I don't believe we've had further action on. So uh, you may want to incorporate that, given that it's along the same lines as these three. There's one more left. It's the one that was previously deferred. Okay. Do you want to add a? Okay. Okay. All those in favor of Lily's motion to postpone policy 3210, 3215, and 3250 pursuant to the review by staff for legislative audit recommendations from 2009 and 2015, please say aye. UHY, right. That's a separate thing at this point. Yeah. So all in favor of that, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Now you want to make a new. I'd like to amend something previously adopted to include the UHY audit in the considerations for reviewing the, those three policies and any policies. And did you want to include policy 3231? Yes. Okay, I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 
Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kathleen. Yes, Ms. Pasteur. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so serious. This is just for my clarification. I need some clarification on just what is meant. I'm on page two current, and it's on um, uh, letter B at the top. The board should reserve the right to waive any informality and all bids reject, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I, I would just like some clarification on that. What are the parameters in, in terms of rejection, um, what that means? So this is 3B on page 2 of policy but, 3210? Yeah, but it's no. now for formal bids, under formal bids. Right, right. Um, so... Um, The board always has the right to reject a bid. So for instance, uh, if, if we feel that we were perhaps in error in being inclusive or being clear uh, or based on responses of confusion from the vendors, we would simply just reject all of those bids and, and in most cases reissue uh, the uh, solicitation documents to correct for any confusion. Um, the utilization of contracts by other government agencies is what is uh, been referred to as a cooperative contract or a piggyback contract, which are uh, permitted under Maryland law, provided that we uh, maintain sufficient documentation to show that the proper uh, public approval and public notice uh, were given uh, by and board approval by any other agencies that whose contracts uh, we're going to use. Um, informality in all bids. Um, I would like to get back to you with that answer because I'm not I would be guessing if I, if I tried to answer that part of the of this language or respond to it. Thank you, and I would appreciate that. I don't like that word informality. Um, I don't know what it means for us. I just want to make sure that whatever comes to us, um, I I, I want to see something concrete so that if it comes to us before we sit up here or anyone just uh, starts discussing a bid and it becomes, um, I don't wanna say frivolous, but it, it, I want it to be based <laughs> on something, okay? I know I'm, I'm being circuitous about it, but this looks circuitous to me. I don't know what it means to uh, waive any formality or to reject, it just, it's, too open-ended for me. Um, you Ms. Howie, help? did you want to have that look? Did you have a comment? Yeah. If what I'm Ms. saying doesn't make sense, I just need it clear. I think that your question makes sense, and I, I too would appreciate, Mr. Saris, the next time that we evaluate the policy to right. um, bring us clarification for that and explanation for that. Is and that this is waiving any formality in all bids. That's informality. Yes. So uh, not for, we don't waive formalities. No, waiving so any informality. That's, that I guess is a term of art that I will research and so respond to. what may be helpful to the committee, um, I know Ms. Uh, Ms. Burnop and I presented um, a very high level overview of the purchasing process uh, some months back. So it may be helpful to present um, something similar to the committee uh, because these are terms of art in procurement uh, that the committee would benefit from learning more about. 
And Thank you. I, I appreciate that because only a few of us attended that, as I recall. And it was very helpful, um, very clear. And I think it would be important for all of us to have that undergirding any decisions that we make before we reject, accept, et cetera. Thank you. Mr. Offerman. I just wondered if the, that it might benefit the entire board to, to, to hear that presentation. I think that's a great idea. Um, how long was that presentation, Ms. Halley? 20 minutes? 15, 20 minutes? Is yeah. It wasn't long, I remember, a uh, time frame because we pulled it together very quickly at the end to accommodate schedules. So it really was very manageable, very concise, very on point. So there's two opportunities that we would have to have the presentation scheduled, board retreat or in uh, administrative function of a meeting right. ahead of an open meeting. So we could consider both of those and you and I can uh, work with Ms. Howie and the incoming superintendent to see where on the agenda, whether at the board retreat or whether um, in an administrative function ahead of a regularly scheduled meeting. Good. That's a great idea. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Ms. Howie has corrected me that it should be in an open session, so we would do it in an open session. Okay. So. We'll work with the interim super, uh, excuse me, with the incoming superintendent and um, Ms. Howie and Ms. Burnop to put that on the schedule. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions on that before we move to policy 3410? Okay, hearing none, we're going to move forward to policy 3410, responsibilities and duties, and presenting is Mr. Patillo. Good afternoon. And that's tab seven for board members. Just in time. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Charles Patillo, Executive Director for Business Services. Joining me, I have Ms. Barbara Burnock and Mr. Kenny West, Assistant Director for Transportation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we're gonna start with policy 3410. Um, we bring this before you because it's due up for review in the year of 2018-2019. Um, the changes we made, we made sure it, it uh, we renamed it, I guess, first of all. Secondly, we made sure it clearly delineated um, what we thought transportation services should be and is in our county. And then the third thing is we made sure it conformed with uh, the policy review committee editing conventions. Thank you. Board members, are there questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Pasture? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I, uh, uh, I, I read through this, and if someone could help me uh, uh, and review the, 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 the current policy or rule about students riding the same bus uh, in the morning, the afternoon, and if, because uh, I know a lot of our families have split, have split situations, care situations after school, that wouldn't be the same home address. In fact, then we, I just got a, did we get a, a text that, or a message today talking about a situation where uh, because of a rotating schedule of, of, of a mother working and, and the father being at a different address, there was concern about trying to enable that person to be able to go to different destinations apparently on a, on a, on a uh, some kind of rotating basis from what I can understand. Uh, uh, now, first and foremost, you know, I, I think Everybody recognizes we got to know where the kids are. We have to know what bus they're on uh, all the time. We just can't have people, you know, choosing to go home with their friends or whatever the deal is that way to work from. But if you could, someone could review the current practice, I would, I would, be, I'd be thankful for that. And my understanding, Mr. Offerman, that that is a part of a superintendent's rule. So obviously, staff can speak to the exact practice, but it's not in your policy Thank at you. this point. So should we have? Uh, are, are you gentlemen? We're staff. Okay, So good. you Thank said you. you would like to know what the right. practice is right. the practice here in BCPS is right. as related to multiple. multiple bus stops? Right. Well, it's, it, it's related to some, I'm relating to situations where, where, where students are coming to school from one location but needing to be at a different location in the afternoon. I know there are care 
you know, their aftercare facilities and like that. I'm talking about private mm -hmm. uh, residences or private places where students would go. Grandparents, whatever the deal would be, to help help parents felicitate attendance without worry about the student being in an uncared kind of a situation after school or in, or in some cases before school. And if I can dovetail with Mr. Offerman, we've heard concerns over the last couple years, board members in different formats um, related to transportation and there's a variety of circumstances in which previously parents were able to have students sent home on different buses or picked up on different buses. We have blended families, we have shared custody, we have working families that make different arrangements. Um, even after school activities where children may have um, play centers at school or at a different location. So my understanding was there was a change or a um, maybe a couple years ago uh, in terms of more consistency in the implementation of how um, children are assigned to buses. Um, and one of the emails that we received recently that, that talks about the, um, the children's and the family's issues referred to section B2 under rule, under rule 3410. So that's on page two of rule 3410. So the, the question would be is, what is the practice in implementing the rule and also what any suggestions there would be to try and address those concerns and would those <coughs> concerns need to be addressed at the policy level or would it be a consideration of um, the policy review committee recommending to the full board to make a suggestion to the superintendent. Okay, so I'll start with the practice, which I think that's what Mr. Yes. Offerman's yes. initial question was. Thank you. So, and I'll start off and then Mr. West will we'll jump in. Um, but currently our practice is the bus stop must be the same five days a week in the a.m. And then in the p.m. it can be a different bus stop, but it has to be the same, same. every day in the p.m. Okay. So the a.m. can be different from a.m. and p.m., but every day in the a.m. it has to be Room 114, Board of Education Building. In the PM, it can be administration building, but again, for five days a week, it has to be the same. Um, again, to Ms. Causey's comments, we have been hearing that the last couple years, and it's more, I think, consistent enforcement than it is anything changing from a transportation point of view. Um, in the last, I guess, year and a half to two years, um, we work, working through Mr. Stewart, who asked us to maybe put together a work group. So we did do that. We had uh, administrators, safety, office of transportation, personnel, and um, again, other key stakeholders. Did we have a, that was it? Law office, I'm sorry. We did have um, Stephen there from law office. So again, through that work group, the administrators were that, at that work group made it loud and clear, kind of something you referred to in the beginning is that they don't want to take on that responsibility of every day of the week knowing which bus a student goes on if it's different. Again, it's tough enough from AM to PM knowing, but the permutations that you would have to go through every day that it could be different, they just thought especially at an elementary level, and we did have secondary principals there and elementary, but specifically the elementary school principals just said that they thought it would be very tough to enforce that, or even not enforce it as much as knowing, okay, today what bus should little Charles be on? Is he going to see his mom? Is he going to see his grandma? Is he going to the Y? Again, in the AM, if it's the same every day, they thought that they could work through that, and the PM, the same, but they thought just the different permutations that could happen every day if it's somewhere different, they just worry that that would um, affect the safety. So. so how does the system respond now, to, for instance, to shared custody, where there are situations where children may be in a different location uh, in the, during the week? Example would be someone who is, lives with his mother. I know examples of, of children who live with their father Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or four, three or four days, and then the, and the mother. So they obviously and and and, the, and it's not the same address. <laughs> so so that puts them on uh, puts the onus on the parent to bring them, okay, uh, or or drive over to the other parent's residence in order to 
to put the child on the bus and to pick the child up if they're coming home to the same address. And, I, you know, I, I, I'm not saying the way they make a policy. I'm just, I just want to make sure, you know, from what, what you're explaining, someone in that situation that has a, uh, a shared custody situation w would be responsible then for handling transportation when the child was not in the home where the primary transportation is, uh, is uh, established. So if it's mom Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and dad Thursday, Friday, and mom is really three days a week, then it's dad's job in order to get him to school or to get her to school or get them on the same bus on those, uh, on, on those days. Is that, is, that, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, week to week, it has to stay the same. Again, our policy is week to week, every day of the week, it has to stay the same. Right. Are there some principals out there who may work with a family on their own? Absolutely. Well, I think we'd be naive to believe that doesn't happen. But as a system, I don't know, that, again, to the points I made earlier, whether we could police, enforce, uphold a policy of every day of the week, it could be different. Right. And again, a principal knows their students, you know, more so than us, there's a relationship. Absolutely. So they have a better judgment of which situations make sense, whether it's possible or not. From a central office point of view, we could never assess that, I think. Ms. Pasture. Mm -hmm. I want to address that having been a school principal and we had to do exactly what you said because the fear becomes this. If the system tries to take that on, we've had situations where the child has said, or even a parent or someone has said, the child is going to so-and-so's house and it, didn't, it wasn't consistent and it didn't always happen and now if people are not as, as gracious the one time that the child didn't go to that house and then it becomes, it comes back right. on the school. So, or the system. But we also recognize that those situations happen. So we used the same process and we needed to see some paper or something that was legal to <coughs> talk about where they were going on another day and worked it out with transportation and the parent, so we were clear. I, really, I know that we get those comments, but I think the parent and the school, if it's the same all week in the morning, same all week in the evening, it was just very simple. We knew the children were safe if they worked it out with the school, and we did it with transportation. Now, there's no rule, no policy there, but we never lost any children. But there were other nightmares where children were not where they were supposed to be because um, there was no documentation. People were getting on the bus and saying, I'm going. But the bus driver also has to hold to that. They're supposed to be checking. They're supposed to know who's on the bus. That must happen. That doesn't always happen. So all of those pieces must be in place. So to follow up with what Ms. Pasteur said, I know for a fact that one of the things that happens in my community is that children decide arbitrarily on their own right. without communicating with anyone that they're going to get on and off at different stops and they're even going to get on and off different buses to be able to be with their friends. And then what ends up happening is, and what happened in, in Hillendale this school year, is that a driver thought they could do a double run because there weren't that many kids on a bus one day for one route. And then when they tried to do it the next day, all of a sudden, all the kids that are normally supposed to be there were there, and they weren't the day before. And so I don't see anything anywhere in this policy that makes the bus driver have to be accountable that the children are getting on and off the bus they're supposed to be getting on and off, and at the stops, they're supposed to be getting on and off. Who enforces that? So I guess, first of all, again, we, 
believe no child should be left behind. So if there's a kid at a stop or a kid at school that gets home, needs to get home, we're going to take them home. We'll sort out um, the crowdedness or other things later. If it's in the afternoon and it's at the school, it is the principal, and Ms. Pasteur can weigh in if she thinks differently. We believe it is the principal or administration who decide who gets on what bus or kind of monitors that. So at the bus, the bus stop, again, depending on age, there are parents at bus stops. Sometimes, obviously, secondary is probably less likely that a parent will be there so. to make sure that the right kids get on the right buses. But again, we've told our drivers from a management point of view, if there's a question, take the kid to school first and then let's get to school and talk about what the question is. We don't want them to leave a kid curbside so what debating do you on whether they're a rider if they're a Baltimore County Public School Systems kid. So I had to drive my daughter to school because she got to the bus stop and when her bus showed up, there was no room on the bus for her to physically get on the bus. So obviously, the implication of picking some kids up where they're not supposed to be is that a child at a bus stop who's supposed to be there and isn't getting picked up. And this is, I mean, I use that as one example, but we get emails about these kind of things all the time. And the point of having policies which rules and procedures get written off of is that you'll have consistency in the school system. So I'm concerned that our policies, rules, and procedures are not being applied consistently. And I'd like to know what we can put in this policy that will cause those rules and procedures to be followed consistently. Because we shouldn't have a bus arrive at a stop and children at that bus stop can't physically get on the bus. As in, all the seats are filled and children are already standing in the aisles. And when the bus door opens, the bus driver is telling kids, wait, you guys can get on. The rest of you, you can't get on. There's no room. So my daughter comes home and shows up at my house and says, mom, you got to take me to school. What if I worked? What if I wasn't home? So from an operational standpoint, we assign students to buses based on capacity. And when there are more students than there are seats, we will create an additional route, or we will move bus stops from one route to another. Um, as a course of a practice, we do instruct our drivers, if they arrive at a bus stop, they are not to leave any students. So the, the other side of that is, if we pull up at a bus stop and the driver checks and says, you are not normally a student who rides this bus, um, however, the child can show, I do go to the school, we don't want to leave that child at that bus stop. In the event that the bus reaches capacity and the driver is not able to transport the additional students, they will then call into transportation and we will have to put another bus out to, to do what we call a cleanup run. But um, that is not normally the case. The case would, would be more likely to occur that if a parent takes a child to a bus stop um, to which that child is not assigned, there typically will be space on that bus for the few instances where there's one or two additional children. I think it's, it's we would rather have the child ride the bus than leave a child and then have space on that bus. And again, I think, and I'll make this quick comment, and I know you want to say something, Ms. Pastor. We also partner with administrators too. If there's a bus that um, parents are saying is overcrowded or they're illegal riders, we work with the uh, administrators, the AP, the principal. They have a bus list. As the bus gets to school, they may check the kids as they get off or get on, et cetera, depending on whether it's an afternoon run or, or a morning run. So when we're notified about those events, we do work with the administration to make sure those are, who are supposed to be on that bus are on it. Yes, Ms. Pastor. OK, do, are there still incident reports? There used to be. I'd bus referrals? Not a referral. We used to get, for example, what Mrs. Rowe just indicated, the <coughs> bus is crowded today, might not be crowded the next day or whatever. So we'd get a report. OK, I'd get a report. Our administrators would get a, a report, and we expected a report because it's not a policy problem here. I see this as a communication follow-through problem. 
So just as you pointed out, working with the administrators. But if the administrator on the day when Ms. Rowe had to take her child to school doesn't get something that says today this bus that is usually not crowded was crowded. So the administrator has no way of knowing that there was a problem, which means that it could happen again and again and again. So you can't stop it. I don't know that that is something, the policy, the policy is clear, but where the breakdown is is the implementation and that relationship. So if the bus driver doesn't, and the bus driver can't always verbally articulate what the problem is that day, but we used to get pieces of paper that could go to the person who was on duty that says, Here's the problem. It's not a referral, a, a behavioral referral. It's something that says this is something that happened that should not be happening. Then you would know which, um, which, um, you would know then uh, which bus and all of that to handle, and you could straighten it out. Then you handle it out. It should come back to the school and handle that with the parents because you're correct. Uh, we would not be happy if children were left on a corner, but it shouldn't happen repeatedly. And again, as Ms. Rowe pointed out, children often make decisions. I'm going to have a sleepover, go into my friend's house for a sleepover. I'm going home with that person. No one knows who's on the bus, whatever. So there has to be that connection with um, the school. There used to be IDs, so the bus driver can visually see that this person belongs on the bus. I haven't been out that long ago, but all of those things, well, maybe I have, but all of those things <coughs> should still be in place because they safeguard the children and they eliminate all of these kinds of things from happening. But I don't see it as necessarily a policy, but how we work how transportation works with our administrators. Ms. Rowe, and then I have comments too, thank you. So I see what Ms. Pesher is saying about it not being a policy issue, but I would like to make a motion to amend the phrase, the board directs the superintendent to amend this policy. It's, it's section three, it's on the last um, page two to include um, the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy and report um, back to the board annually. Because I'd like to see what our actual performance is as far as getting the children who are eligible and assigned to buses to school on time and how many times we have to do cleanup runs and this sort of thing. Because what I'm seeing in my community is that this is not always infrequent. The day I took my daughter to school, four other buses were late and kids aren't getting to school always before the bell. And that's a problem, especially in a school where a lot of the kids are dependent on free breakfast. So. That's my motion to add to that policy, to add to that sentence, implement this policy and report to the board annually. Is there a second? I'm sorry, was there a second? I'll second it for purposes of discussion. Um, Can I, are, are you going to speak to her motion? Sure. Okay, because I, 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 I think I know where Ms. Rowe is going. I just, okay, but if okay. you're going to speak to it, go ahead. Um, I would agree that there are a number of um, situations that we've, um, the board has been informed about, um, not just through personal experience, because there are, I believe it's six parents on the board now, but also through emails and phone calls and so forth uh, with transportation um, and the board needs to understand more clearly how effective we're being in transporting the children safely and are there 
consistent issues that do need to be addressed in a more holistic way for the system, whether it's efficiencies in how the transportation is set up, but also if it if it is policy or procedure related to situations our families have, whether it's shared custody, work uh, situations, daycare situations that arise. Um, and having an annual report would give a format and, and a function to put all of those pieces together and become a point of discussion for the board. So I would support that. Ms. Pestor. I support Ms. Rose's um, motion um, intellectually. The reason I wouldn't second it is because I don't think it, go, it's, it goes far enough. I, don't, I, I think if they're going to give a report, we need to say, and that probably wouldn't be a part of the policy, I want a report that says the things that we just talked about, that says, I want to know what was done with, from between transportation and schools so that administrators are very clear and all of them are doing the same thing, that bus drivers have those little pieces of paper, an incident report. I want to know how many were given out, how often from the same route, et cetera, that this information was given to the administrators and that situations are going to be changed. Because as many times, and, and it, it, it wasn't a miracle, but for the number of people, when you have 1,600 children in a school and you can eliminate this issue, then I know it's not impossible. But it required our own conversation with our dispatcher, with our bus drivers. If we had to make the piece of paper, we need to know this. And when we knew it, we can eliminate it because we could be in charge, the we being administrators, we were in charge at, to have that relationship with the parents to say, don't do this. It's, it's not going to happen. This is, we will take your child off the bus because this is now a violation. You're not following it. So I agree there should be something that we could see, but to just say that we get an annual report, an annual report of what? I want to know about what things were done through transportation with schools specifically to change this behavior and to see what schools are buying in and doing what they're supposed to be doing and which are <clears throat> not. How we fix this, it really isn't rocket science. Thank you, Ms. Pasture. And I would, um, I'm going to make a comment and then Ms. Howie also. Um, uh, wants to uh, make a comment. I would say that the annual report should reflect what we have in the policy. And and after we work through this, um, I was also going to ask some questions about why some things were removed from the policy in terms of um, the standards and parameters that the board wants. Do you see the first on page one? lines 9, 10, and 11. That's something that I was going to address. But I'll let Ms. Howie chime in now. So just a question and a comment. My question would be um, exactly what the board's expectations are, or the committee's expectations are with respect to what you would like in a report right. because simply indicating that the board wishes a report without right. uh, instructing staff further um, does put staff in a quandary. And then second, with respect to your uh, policy editing conventions, um, the at least previous uh, committees have indicated that there shall be implementation language, and the implementation language is uh, the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy. So that is, so staff is bringing back what uh, at least, as I said, previous committees have indicated that they want and that that is a measure of accountability for staff uh, to actually implement the policy that uh, the board has enacted. I believe, haven't we had edited that line before to include reporting fairly recently? There are definitely policies that require reports. That is true. But, I mean, we've edited that actual line. 
to include reporting? I, I believe that we have, um, but I, in hearing Ms. Howie's explanation and question and looking at the page two mm -hmm. of policy 3410, under implementation is paragraph three, it would make sense and be more clear if we had a paragraph four that is reporting. Okay. And then we could make that right. request for a report as robust as we felt that particular policy required. So I'm gonna, can I change my motion? If you wanna withdraw your motion? I'd like to withdraw my motion. And, and as I seconded it, I would agree to And withdraw I would it. like to move that we add a section four for reporting and then we can flesh out language for that. Do you want to, I let me ask you to consider this. Can you withdraw your motion and perhaps let us work through more of the policy in terms of, of yeah. what the policy is I'm just is suggesting asking. that we put like four as a four dot reporting and then that way my motion is that that's there and we can figure out the language and come back to it. I don't want to forget that we wanted to do that. I don't think we're going to forget. Okay. So do you want to withdraw that motion for the moment? I will, yes. Okay, thank you. I, Mr. I, would, I, I think we'd do a better job by by shell by, by putting by by not doing any of this today and having until perhaps our, our next meeting in the fall, although certainly this is a critical issue and we've heard tons of times from people that way. And, 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 and to get specifically what we want in the report. I also want to add that one of the things that uh, I'm working on, uh, not involved with this committee, but I will add it now anyway is in the superintendent uh, yearly evaluation that transportation and the report on transportation is, is, is going to be part of, uh, I hope is going to be part of that if the board uh, agrees to, uh, to, to do that. And I mean that in terms of, you know, trying to get a handle on that. I also think that really uh, an annual report, and I don't want to add, you know, tremendous amount of work, but I, I, I would like to see a report like, tw you know, like the end of the first semester of the second marking term and then one at the end. Uh, yeah, I don't want to wait a whole year and, and then find out, you know, and we're going to hear incidental reports all the time. We know that. But I'll have to get a handle on how big an issue this this is. So while I want to postpone, I think I'd like to postpone this, this policy, policy, although I know that's an issue, okay? But I, I think we might do a better job if we then would speak to people, you know, in transportation and, and, uh, and get a real handle on what we want the report to say. That's, I, I would feel more comfortable doing that. I'm not opposed to this at all. I think it's a really good idea. I just want to do it once and try to do it, to, you know, as, as well as we can. And maybe get the input of, you know, other, other, other people other than the policy committee. Okay. Can we consider that um, while I ask other questions about the policy? Sure. Because it may be that there's additional reasons to work more on this policy. Sure. Okay. Um, some of the other um, questions that I had related to page one, paragraph one policy statement. It is, the brackets are around this statement. The Board of Education of Baltimore County recognizes its responsibility to provide transportation services and establish bus stops for eligible students based on safety, efficiency, adequacy, and economy. And I'm curious why that was taken out because I think as a board that does clearly state what we want as a board to be provided for every child and for the system as a whole. I think it was changed um, just for no other reason than to make it clear what this, since this was renamed um, transportation services, we thought that that public policy statement um, was more clear as to what the transportation services would be. Okay, well then. Additional reason for 3410 is 3410 specifically speaks more to the eligibility of students to ride, <coughs> um, to have transportation, whereas 3420 more speaks to routing, and that's where that, that efficiency piece comes in. So is a similar statement 
to what was taken out in 3410. Is that in 3420? It's in your packet. 3420. So that. So it does speak to the primary consideration in establishing these bus routes and bus stops is the safety of the riders, but it does not speak to efficiency, adequacy, and economy because we, we do know that we have fiscal constraints. Safety has to be the first criteria. So I would like to see those statements in, and if, it, if staff thinks it would be better in policy 3420, I'm amenable to that, certainly. Um, we did at one point consider language like that, and it did not stay in the final draft. It, at one point it said it maximizes safety and efficiency. So it would be, we could add that back, just at the end of that thing. We did have it in one of our drafts. Okay, so we're speaking now to 3420. Correct. I think we still believe it should be in 3420, not 3410. Okay, that does make sense. So I will. Withdraw my motion. And we will note that there is additional language relative to that in 3420. And then when we get to 3420, I'd like to add those additional clauses in, into this. Ms. Pasteur. So I'm probably confused now, so I thank you for all that you're doing to try to take away our confusion or our concerns, because I'm still on 3410, right. and I'm at letter C. School bus provided under the Jersey and Baltimore established stops at midday for all half day pre kindergarten students. Can you clarify that for me? Language is coming out. That's bracketed. On page one under current. Oh, yeah, from yeah. Okay. Excuse Let me go back. All right, but it's my question. My question. Wait a minute. Is. It's practice. My thing is about the half day. It's about the pre-kindergarten. So I don't know whether it's here or somewhere else. I'm, I'm conf I just want to know where we should be having a discussion about the children who are in pre-K, who, for example, go to Camp Field, who have to ride more than one bus, and they are unattended, and what happens, particularly the very, um, the several times, many times that they are late getting to Campfield, and when they stop at a school, an uh, elementary school, uh, when the bus doesn't come, and they're sitting there in a lobby or somewhere waiting for a bus. I just want to know when is the time to have the conversation about how we're busing pre-K children, that's a concern. So I saw that. Is, is this the time? Because we do need to rethink how we're busing pre-K children. I, um, I hear your question, and I also was curious about, because in 3410, uh, about that issue, Ms. Pestur, um, because in 3410, page one, paragraph three, there is language that is deleted, but then it does remain all half-day pre-kindergarten students. Mm -hmm. And my question was, do we ever have full-day pre-K? Are we? We do now. Okay, so there needs to be an addition there right. for all half-day pre-kindergarten students and then all full-day pre-kindergarten students. Should we just put all pre-kindergarten students? That, let's ask staff if there is a distinction between those programs where we would need to have a distinction in the policy. 
the I'm intent sorry. behind uh, yeah. letter A number three is to speak specifically to the fact that we provide midday service. So that, that's, that is the, the intent behind that. So when a pre-K child, and we do have, I believe there's four schools with all day programs, those students ride their regular buses that come in on, in the AM and the PM, just like K through five. So full day, so our schools that have full day pre-kindergarten programs are covered under the elementary. Correct. So I think it would be clear to Ms. Pasture's point to have elementary comma including full day pre-K students and middle school students who must walk more than one mile to the assigned school. Actually, I take that back. Our pre-K students are not supposed to walk. At all. Right. They get door to door service, I think. Right, so there is a, there is a reason to do the um, pre-K full day and half day separately. Pre-K students who reside within one mile do are, are considered walkers unless until midday. So we do not provide transportation to all the pre-Ks who are within the walking boundary. We provide transportation at midday. I would like to see that spelled out specifically in the policy that those age and program differences exist. Does I'd that like make sense, Ms. Pasture? Would that start to help the conversation about our little people <laughs> I, <laughs> and the I, differences in their transportation services? Yes, I just need someone to talk to me about why children who are pre-K ride more than one bus and why they even sit in what would be their home school. And I understand it's about overcrowdedness, I guess, um, sit in their home school while they're waiting for the bus that's late. You know what I'm saying? I really need that conversation because we really do need to think about the fact this conversation now so then you have the school personnel who no longer in his or her own classroom because they have to watch the children and 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 honestly I'm not telling you what I heard I've watched this and it just it can't happen not for these babies that they're just this no one I just would like someone to take a look at why they are riding more than one bus, and in some cases, more than two. Can someone speak to that for Ms. Pasture? I think we would need to do some more research. So given, Ms. Pasture, that we don't have the answers to your questions, do you see that we need to postpone this policy until we can have a better understanding? Because, I mean, it's clear that the Policy Review Committee wants to do what is best for our children. And especially with the little people, there are greater concerns for their safety and the timeliness of their arrival at their programs. Can Ms. I, Rowe? Even though we're gonna vote to postpone it can I ask a couple questions yet? yes because so I know. still I also have okay. other questions and I think that this conversation is great in order to inform staff and have Ms. Howie understand what the concerns are so that the next draft could come back um, with some of this language included mm -hmm. to address our concerns but also to have that additional information brought to us maybe in a weekly update so that we have time to digest it before we come back to the next policy review committee meeting so so yeah. if if you want to ask your questions okay. please so can you the first thing i want to know is can you explain what you just said about how we provide pre-k students with midday service do we provide midday service even if they live within one mile how are some pre-k students walkers and some are not and some might be but only you lost me there 
during the morning and the afternoon, mm -hmm. if you reside within, if a student resides within the one mile radius of an elementary school, then they are designated as walkers. Of course, we take into consideration the speed limits, the topography, railroad crossings, et cetera, and then we will reduce that one mile radius of the school. Um, all else notwithstanding, if you're within that one mile, then you are designated as a walker. No matter what. Correct. Okay. During the midday, it is different. So the students who are transported during the midday would be your preschool students, your three-year-olds, and pre-K students, your four-year-olds. So we do provide transportation to those students during midday hours. The significant difference during midday hours is they're not peers walking with them because they're all in school and there are no crossing guards. So th those are the- they only walk, they get midday service? That is correct. Okay. That is correct. Because of no peers and no crossing guards. Correct, so that infrastructure, most of the crossing guards, is not in place for the midday hours. Okay, so my other question is, there's language in section 2A2 that talks about high school students who must walk more than one and a half miles to the assigned school. Um, when you say assigned school, do you mean the school that they're supposed to go to by virtue of where they live, or do you mean the school that they're enrolled at? Because sometimes people are enrolled at a school that is not the school that is where they would go in their zone, but I'm not sure what assigned school means. School of attendance. So where they're enrolled. Correct. So Ms. Rose, so for instance, if a student lives in Towson, and is zoned to go to Towson High School, but they applied to Carver Arts Magnet School and got into Carver, that one and a half mile walker zone still applies to Carver. Correct. So okay. So if and they, that sometimes could be the case in other okay. parts of the county. Okay. So. All right, so by, but by assigned, you mean where they're enrolled to attend? Correct. Okay. Um, I don't understand why section D and section E are being removed because I would think establishing in our policies who has supervision for watching children at bus stops and walking would be important. Is that being moved to some other policy or are we just deleting it? That language went to 3420 right. because again, 3420 is more related to bus stops. Okay. Can you uh, outline, I know we're on policy 3410, but before we forget Ms. Rowe's point, can you address where in policy 3420 it talks about the parents' responsibility for walkers? Because I did not see that. Yeah, I'm sorry, rule 3420. Yeah. Rule 3420. Correct. Okay. Um. So do we want to keep it in the policy? Is there some reason that it shouldn't be in the policy? Because I think that uh, there's a always a lot of discussion around if a child is at a bus stop, are they under the school's legal jurisdiction yet or are they under their parents? And I think that the policy should clearly state exactly what the point is in the transfer that the school system is responsible for the student. Ms. Pasture, did you want to speak to that? No, I'm, my brain is still on a sign school, one and a half of a sign school. So I'll wait. Okay. Because I agree with Ms. Rowe. I think it should be in the policy, clearly stated, either in 3410 or 3420, wherever staff feels it's more appropriate, 
but I think it should be clear in policy that the supervision of students while walking to, from, or waiting at the established bus stop is the responsibility of the student's parents or guardians. So which policy would staff feel that's more appropriate? You'd like to look at it? Yeah. You'd like to look at it? I'll look at that. Okay, well, I'm gonna make a motion that staff include that in either policy 3410 or 3420. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? No, I mean, I'm making a motion that this phrase be included in either policy 3410 or policy 3420 based on staff input that the supervision of students while walking to, from, or waiting at the established bus stop is the responsibility of the student's parents or guardians. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, the motion carries unanimously. Ms. Clark, did you have that? Thank you. Ms. Pasture, did you want to revisit the issue of the assigned school? Okay. Thank you. Certainly. I think it's good to have all this discussion and then staff can bring it back to us with um, robust input. <laughs> okay. Assigned school. I'm having fought this issue prior to the, being on the school board with groups of parents who, for <laughs> them, not with, for them, um, even though they get the notice that if you go to certain schools, the transportation is not provided, your child is on his or her own. And, um, and they know that, they still maintain because they can come back and say, well, it's further than a mile and a half so we want transportation, all right? And I went through that with the parents who were sending their children to Patapsco from the Owens Mills, Randallstown area. Magnet. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this, this, it, this, and they did come back to this and say, well, if Carver students, for example, in Randallstown, they were picked up at Randallstown High School and taken there. So the transportation was provided. Um, and ultimately, the prize was that they could go to Lock Raven and get a bus to go to Patapsco, which they were doing, going back to Ms. Rose earlier thing, they were doing anyway. They were illegally going to Lock Raven and getting on a bus and no one was asking them and they're taking them to Patapsco with the other magnet, the real magnet children. So how do you, f this needs, in my brain needs to be fixed because this is a piece that was used. I don't know what language, but this is really not so. Um, so somewhere in there it needs to say unless otherwise stipulated or whatever, unless you've been told that the pop, that your child's not gonna get the transportation wherever, because I'm telling you, they use this. I would like the opportunity to double check, but in the magnet policy, there is language around oh, transportation. Yeah. Um, but I want to confirm that I know that we do have language that's, that says if there is space on the bus, then a parent can utilize that um, by going through transportation. Um, but I want to confirm that in under what circumstances. Yeah. I would really love for you to confirm that um, but because they were repeatedly told by the magnet office that and, and referred back to the line that says transportation is not provided. And then when you have uh, 78 children, see how the transport, there, there's no space. And then it becomes an issue of whose child gets to get, if that's the case, gets permission to get on a bus and whose child doesn't. Yes, ma'am. And I, again, I want to confirm that because there's, um, 
There's two other policies that relate to that is magnet and special permission transfer. And they do have language, and maybe special permission transfer, that there's language that if a parent can get a child to a certain stop, um, then that child may ride. It, the, the route, the bus cannot deviate from the route, and it has to be through transportation. So I want to confirm that. And I appreciate that, and, and that we do work on clarifying it because, again, when it reached a feverish pitch, the, um, um, the former superintendents, um, uh, what do I want to say, answer to it was to say, you get your children to Lock Raven, we'll have a bus at Lock Raven to take them. Well, they were already going to Lock Raven, so that didn't make them happy. So again, I would appreciate if you would look at in all of those spots to see what the language is, because truly, when it's your child, We, we shall investigate that. Um, but if you look at 3410, it does specifically mention magnet programs on B3. So, I, I, Listen, I know you're right. I've gone through each one with them and said, look at this. And then they say, all right, now look at this. <laughs> okay. So I understand what you're saying. You're absolutely correct. Ms. Rowe. So I'm not sure that assigned school really means the school you're enrolled in. I think the way this policy reads, and because we do continue the exceptions of the assigned school, I think the assigned school means the school you're zoned to. I do not think that it means the school that you're enrolled in. And if we're sitting there having this conversation about what assigned school means, then I think that in this policy there needs to be a definition. Assigned school is the school you are zoned to by virtue of where you live. And if you somehow end up enrolled at a different school, those provisions are in Section B. Because when I see Section B, I see uh, special education students, homeless, magnet, and the child care facilities, which are the only reasons I'm aware of that you can get a different type of bus transportation to or from a different school situation than where you're assigned by virtue of where you live in your zone. So I think in reading through this that there, there is ambiguity about what assigned school means and I think that what this policy means in section A is it's referring to the normal standards by virtue of where you're zoned and then B is Stab establishing the policies for the differences. So I think we need to be very clear about what assigned school means. Does staff have language that they would um, like to offer or is that another item that you'd like to um, flesh out and then bring back to us when you bring There's back the policy? There's enough going on that it seems to me like we better coordinate the two policies and review this language and we can look at definitions as well. Okay, because I do agree with Ms. Rowe that there's definitely consensus in the committee that the assignment needs to be spelled it, out. It was difficult separating the two policies and aligning them, so I think with this feedback, we can probably do a better job. Okay, great. And she and is correct. The science school in the past always meant the one that you were supposed to go to based on your residence. Okay. So if that changed, we need that change. Okay. And additionally, Ms. Howie is taking her meticulous notes and can circle back with um, the transportation staff and Ms. Burnop in coming up with the um, additional revisions. Did board members have other questions about policy 3410? Um, so we did want to also make a note uh, to add a paragraph four reporting. Lily, do you wanna make that motion now and we can see if there's consensus on the board for them to bring that back in the next draft? Right. Do you want we me to, to save it for the end? make it now? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like to move that we add a section 
four on reporting and that that section include language that would um, ask for the Department of Transportation to report on any anomalies to the effectiveness of following this policy and that that be done at the beginning of the school year and John what did you want the end of the school well, year I, I, at I the would end think, of the school year I would think we, well I was going to ask the middle of the school year and the end of the school year but okay it's so whatever. middle and end of the school year that's I think that's the way to, I, I think that we get a, a, a more up-to-date yeah. kind of thing going on <laughs> <coughs> um, so you made a motion I would I would ask us to consider um, less specific language and have staff bring back language. She has what I think. Okay, uh, sure. Um, and uh, supporting a paragraph four reporting. And the other thing that I would like staff to bring back, if the board, if the policy review committee agrees, is um, the options. Because if you have quarterly reports that are developed and discussed within this staff right. That's true then too. there's no reason why the board can't receive that as right. a report so I would look at the options for reporting for the board if it's possible to do quarterly easily then that's something that the policy review committee would like to consider is there support for that yes for me yeah. okay okay do you want me to revise the wording of the motion yes please if you want to okay. withdraw and start over uh, I'm gonna withdraw the motion and so the motion that I'm making is that we add a section four for reporting and that staff come back with recommendations as to the language for reporting, the frequency of reporting at least twice a school year as to exactly when that should happen. Fine. I'll second oh, and, that. And the reporting should be on the, the anomalies to the effective following of the policies. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That Before we go on, can I just say the same? I, I really want to thank you. This is right. transportation is just harrowing. So thank you for listening to the things that we've said. And I just want to make it clear when I said that I, was, I used the term um, not rocket science, it wasn't about what you do, okay, because that's almost rocket science. But what we can do in the schools to support what the department does is not that hard if in the schools we have a clearer understanding and everyone is doing the same thing. Because I wouldn't want your job. <laughs> Thank you for your feedback. Mm -hmm. All right, and I concur with Ms. Pasture. This has been very helpful, this discussion. And um, so we're gonna, we, did, did we already make the motion to, okay, to postpone policy 3410 and 3420? Did we make the motion just to postpone 3410? Okay, so that finishes our work on policy 3410. Look forward to staff um, working on those questions and recommendations. And now we're going to move to policy 3420 because I know I have at least one phrase that I want to add to it uh, for staff to bring back. So, um, but before I make my comments, does uh, any other board member have any specific questions or comments about policy 3420? Or did staff have any um, comments you wanted to make to us? No, on prior. this particular one, we just renamed it, and again, we made sure it followed the editing convention. So, okay, thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, perhaps it's because of my lack of uh, uh, knowledge of the system, but in two uh, B two, private school students shall adhere to the same behavior and safety rules and regulations that are required of public school students when utilizing BCPS transportation services. Can you give me an example? Of what of what students are using these? Uh, I mean, are there particular schools, or I'm just interested. 
We currently do not provide um, service to private schools. Um, right. let, let me rephrase that. We provide service to non-public schools. Okay. And they can be considered private. Right. The other piece, the other um, private schools to which this refers are actual private schools where students who reside within Baltimore County are not enrolled in Baltimore County Public Schools. Okay. They may be enrolled in a true private school. Right. They may be enrolled in a true private school. So a private school can petition the Office of Transportation and therefore the board for us to provide service. And there is language in the policy that guides us. So, um, for example, if we were to do that, we would not have our bus routes deviate um, from existing routes. We still have to provide service to students who are enrolled in Baltimore County Public Schools, mm -hmm. and there has to be space on those buses. Um, so as with, if it's within those guidelines, then we could potentially provide service to students who attend private schools. And that language um, to which you've just referred is speaking to the behavior expectations for those private school students while they're riding buses. Okay. Thank you. But you're saying that that does not currently happen? I'm not aware of any. Um, we have been asked about that. Um, I think the most recent conversation was about a year and a half, two years ago. We have been asked. Um, however, when we look at schedules and capacities and so forth, um, our schedules will not consistently have those students to their school on time and then pick them up while our buses are in that particular area. Um, there was no congruency at all. I see. Ms. Rowe, did you have a question? No. Okay. I thought I might. I would just like to say that um, we discussed it previously, and but uh, staff said it should be in this policy 3420. I would like to make a motion that in um, parag on paragraph two standards, we have a new A and then the other letters filter down. And the new A says the Board of Education recognizes its responsibility to provide school transportation services and establish bus stops for eligible students based on safety, efficiency, adequacy. I'm going to put in there consistency based on Ms. Pasture's previous comments and economy. Second. Thank you, Ms. Rowe, for a second. Is there other discussion from our other committee members? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments before we make a motion to postpone this policy to come back with 3410? Right. Okay, so I make a mo motion to postpone policy 3420 to come back alongside policy 3410 after staff has had additional time to work on it. Is there I'll a second? second that. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries, and we are now moving on to Ms. Howie in the proposed PRC meeting schedule for 2019-2020. Thank you. Members of the committee, um, staff is presenting for your consideration these dates uh, for your meetings in 2019-2020. Uh, these dates have been presented to Ms. Gover to determine whether or not there are any conflicts uh, with any other committee meetings, and there are not. Thank you. Board members, are there questions or comments? I was just going to ask, Is um, there's not typically a PRC meeting in August. Is there... Um, time for staff to have one or interest in board members. It just seems like we have a lot of policies you want to have one this in August? flux. Yeah. I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. If there's... Yeah, okay. the problem is I have no ability to select or commit to a date in August right now. Okay. That's fine. Scratch that. <laughs> okay. Um...
Okay. Do we need a motion for this? Yes, we. That okay. would be good. I, I move we accept these dates for next year. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. And the next item is uh, policy scheduled for review in 2019-2020 in accordance with Rule 8130. And for that, Ms. Howie. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, you have before you uh, behind tab 10 uh, what the superintendent must present uh, pursuant to Superintendent's Rule 8130. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have heard me already um, over the years uh, speak about 8130. Uh, the superintendent's rule follows the board policy. Your board policy indicates that you as a board of education will review your policies every five years. The superintendent, um, by his own rule, uh, wanted to make sure that there was accountability um, on the part of the superintendent. So the rule requires that the superintendent present to the board prior to July 30th all those policies which are going to be brought forward by staff for that particular school year. If those policies were amended after December 2001, I believe is what the policy says, or the rule says, excuse me. Um, what, um, what's been done with the 22 policies that are before you is that you currently have a five-year cycle. The seven-year cycle has not yet been approved by the full board. So given that that is the current cycle that's in the, um, the board policy, this uh, follows the five-year cycle and not the seven-year cycle. So that's why you have 22 policies that the superintendent proposes bringing to you during the 1920 school year. Board members, is there discussion, questions, or comments? And as I said, this is simply for information. It doesn't require any action on your part. Um, it will be presented as an information item um, in an upcoming board meeting. Thank you. And then you have, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna ask if board sure. members had, um, maybe just touch on what are the opportunities for board members to request that policies be reviewed additional policies be added to our list? Uh, that's something that's been done over the past several years. When the full board requests or this committee requests that there be particular policies that um, staff look into based on board member interest. Um, one of the things that I am going to propose later in the school year, however, after uh, policy 8130 is passed is that this particular list be amended so that the board will have more of an opportunity to bring forward what interests the board as opposed to the simple five and seven year cycle. Uh, because as issues uh, become emergent, uh, you are allowing yourself or you do not want to hamper uh, the board's ability to study particular interest in, uh, issues. Sure. Okay, great. So the next item is item 11, and it is regarding the policy editing conventions. Yes, thank you. Um, members of the committee, uh, it's hard to describe how happy bureaucrats get with um, policies on policies and then procedures based on those policies. And that's what uh, the policy editing conventions are. Uh, once upon a time uh, in Baltimore County, policies were not brought before the board in a specific fashion. Um, there was no guarantee that one amendment, one recommended would, amendment would look like another. Um, so the, uh, it was actually at the behest of this committee that there were specific uh, guidelines in the form of the editing conventions that were put in place. These conventions are reviewed by you as the committee annually so that when staff comes before you and says, now based on the editing conventions, this is how we're changing this comma, this period, uh, this particular title, that is again at your behest so that all of your policies look the same. What Ms. Clark does is push these out to staff 
so that staff is aware of how the board wants to see policies, so that staff is aware that when amendments come before you, uh, that when policies are amended, that they look the same, mm -hmm. because that is uh, what the, the committee has asked for. So obviously, if there are particular conventions that the committee would now like to see, do you want to see um, a standard section four about reporting? Uh, the section three, for example, about implementation was, again, a request that this committee made. So that is why it is now in every policy that's presented to the board. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Do board members have questions or comments related to this? Ms. Rowe. So I would like something in the editing conventions that allow us to have the, the option to have standard language for reporting, but I don't know that every single policy needs reporting, but certain ones do. Mr. Offerman, do you have a comment related uh, to Ms. Rowe? I, I, I don't know if, uh, uh, since we, we've already basically done that today once, is that correct? Okay, so yes. we can do it policy by policy. We can. Okay, uh, so I'm assuming that, you know, I don't need, if we needed to change this doc, this based on the fact that we're able to do it now, just my opinion. I'm not opposed to it, I'm just, I just don't want to make it any more complex than it is. I would just be curious in, um, Having, having it there so that when staff brings forward the policies, they would be prepared to say the school system regularly provides, develops reports internally related to this, and then the board could see whether it's something that they want to see on the similar time frame that staff sees it, um, just in terms of putting it in their mind. So if the question is on how uh, information is brought before this body, one possibility could be amending policy 8130, which is the policy on policies, uh, that again, as policies are presented, the policies would, or the policy analysis, because the policy analysis is referenced in that policy, that the analysis include as a standard section not only cost of implementation, not only legal references, but could also include uh, the sorts of reporting that um, is available. Yes, I like that. <laughs> okay. Um, policy 8130 is up for second reader, I think, in July, Patty. I like your idea. So um, I can. Uh, has, it, has it been loaded into board docs yet? I'm also looking at the superintendent's rule, so superintendent's rule 8130. Uh, but again, if you want it to be consistently presented, I think it makes sense to be part of the policy analysis as opposed to being placed in the superintendent's <coughs> rule. So we can pull, um, it hasn't been posted yet? Okay, so when t probably post it next week. Where's the section in here on the policy analysis? Um, it isn't in the editing conventions. It's oh, in it's board in. policy 8130. Oh, okay. So, all right. And if it's coming to the July 9th meeting, the um, agenda setting isn't until June 27th. So there's we have time over a okay. week, right? Okay, we have time. So, Ms. Rowe, do you want to make a motion to ask Ms. Howie to amend policy 8130? Yes. To I move that we request staff to amend policy 8130 to include uh, a reporting section in the policy analysis. Okay. 
Ms. Pesher second. Any questions or comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Okay. Thank you for that suggestion sure. and for following through on that. Sure. Are there any other questions or comments for revo uh, regarding policy editing conventions? Okay. Hearing none, do we need to adopt this formally? The editing conventions, yes, you do, because they're presented to you annually, yes. Is there a motion to accept the policy editing conventions? So I move. So I move. Ms. Pasture moved. Uh, Mr. Offerman, would you like to second? Second. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. Good. And these will then be distributed to the um, the full board as information at the next at the July meeting. Okay, great. Thanks. And then the next section, our next item is. Item number 12, which is the Appeals and Hearings Handbook. And for that, Ms. Howie. Thank you. And again, uh, members of the committee, this is a document that's brought before you annually. This document was um, initially created at the behest of the Policy Review Committee. When you have parents um, or a, any other kind of appellant who um, note an appeal before one of your hearing examiners or before you, it was a prior committee's desire that um, those individuals have some sort of information made available to them about the process. Uh, we provide this handbook uh, to your hearing examiners on an annual basis to determine whether or not there are questions that have come up during the school year um, in their work and one of the suggestions, the suggestions that you'll see um, that are highlighted, um, some of them are at the request or suggestion of your hearing examiners. At least one, uh, page three, um, having to do with labor arbitrations. Um, I believe I've said to the board previously that uh, there's been an uptick in the number of requests for arbitration uh, because of changes in the law recently. Uh, we've also included language that, and that would be at page nine, concerning requests for accommodation, um, as well as spoken language interpreters. Uh, we want to know prior to a hearing that an individual um, needs particular accommodation, and in at least one hearing during the school year, um, a parent came with a family interpreter um, we were not aware that the parent needed, or the hearing examiner was not aware the parent needed an interpreter. And again, to make sure that the parent's rights are protected, we want to make sure that an interpreter is provided um, who understands um, the standards um, and understands as well some of the technical language. And that's not always possible with um, someone who is coming in a familial relationship. But again, we want to make sure parents' rights are protected and that we're aware of what parents need. Uh, there's a change to a phone number as well on page eight uh, because we went from 887 to 809. Um, so again, some of these are refinements. Um, I know Ms. Clark uh, in years past has looked through these very carefully to make sure that um, this is as clear as possible to non-lawyers. Uh, I'm not sure that um, that it can be made um, more um, language friendly, uh, but uh, we, we try our best and we also get this translated um, when, upon request. Thank you. Do board members have questions or comments for Ms. Howie regarding I just had one question, and this has come up in, um, it, it's come up in different circumstances, is the number of days and the notification oh. regarding what day is day one and is um, receipt, you know, is it mail, uh, is uh, it, is it, <laughs> if it's hand delivered, uh, where uh, is that information that's in clear? Your policy. Uh, and, all, and also the issue of days versus business days. Calendar days versus, versus business days. Business days. I'm always, I never seem to get that clear in my mind as to what's going on. 
And in terms of, res it depends, uh, because in some cases, for example, in 7305, in appeals of suspensions and expulsions, it is school days. Okay. Uh, because that's then, when you consider the child's exclusion, right, exactly. you want to make sure, and, and I believe that's what the statute says anyway, it does say school days. Right. Um, in other appeals, it is business days. In some appeals, it is calendar days. So we do note that in um, the particular language, um, in the particular sections. So you do have on page three in the footnote, in terms of when um, something is deemed delivered, this is language that we take or have taken straight from Comar, and it's the same standard that the State Department of Ed or State Board of Education applies when it is receiving appeals. So um, this was this was exactly the language that they use. Great, thank you. Is that clear with all board members? Is that it? Okay, thank you. Now do we need to adopt this formally as a uh, policy review committee? By um, consensus, yes. Okay. So board members, are we um, satisfied with the additions and the explanations that have been made? Okay. Let's just have everyone say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. That's all that staff had. Those were um, by, uh, by way of annual report, so every year you'll be receiving um, the 8130 report. Prior to that, going to the full board, you'll be receiving the, um, the handbook. Uh, you'll be receiving the policy editing conventions. Great. Thank you. Um, so, committee members, the floor is now open to members of the committee to discuss issues of concern. I must emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as required by the Open Meetings Act. Is there someone that has um, an issue that they would like to discuss? Or actually, let me just, let me address first policy 8362. So following our April meeting, we asked staff to provide the committee with copies of gifts policies from other Maryland school systems. Those policies were provided to the committee at last month's meeting. However, as Ms. Rowe was not able to attend the meeting, discussion on policy 8362 was postponed. So what I'd like to do is let Ms. Rowe address that at this point. So I did receive um, at the last meeting the packet of information that was shared, um, but there's a lot of information in there, and we've had 10 graduation ceremonies that I went to, and we also have a new superintendent coming in whose feedback I think is important to this because this policy speaks about board members but also about school staff, so I would like to um, table that policy until the next PRC meeting. So it's, so it's not officially on the agenda, so we don't need to officially oh, need table it? We don't need to officially it. table it, okay. But we can um, postpone addressing it until a future meeting. Okay. Okay, Mr. Offerman. Uh, just uh, a quick comment about the the the. the I thought I, I text I emailed you over the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, my concern over the uh, the uh, cell phone situation. We and the April meeting, I believe it was, where uh, we were presented with the current policy involving cell phones. Uh, I was under the impression that, that staff was going to work, or I was going to work with staff at a possibility of, the, of one, one of the possibilities was to develop uh, some kind of a survey through uh, board technology. I, I have had no contact from anybody, or if, I, if I'm supposed to initiate the contact, please, please let me know who to contact. No, sir, we'll have someone from communications or from Draw get in touch with you. Okay, thank oh, you. I, I asked as well. So thank you, Ms. Howie. You'll have someone from communications. Thank you. And then you can start the conversation about what's possible, right? including what questions and what manner, right, exactly. what constituencies uh, right. and time frames and right. so forth. I'm also collecting material from other, uh, other counties about, about, about their policies too. And I'm trying to, I just, I looked at Montgomery County in, in particular since we're 
having a new superintendent from there who's worked on those policies. And they're they're a lot more they're a lot more definitive than than what than what Baltimore County has. For, for instance, there's no cell phone. They, they clearly spell out that high school kids can carry cell phones and use them at lunchtime, but they're not to be used or in in sight during during uh, uh, classroom time. So I, you know, I, I just I think we need to go further than this based on my observation of and uh, the reports that I'm hearing from high school teachers about how how disruptive the whole the whole, uh, the whole cell phone issue can be. So one of the survey distinctions could be how to survey high school right. constituencies, or middle teachers, and parents. elementary parents. The whole, you know, that's just I just want to. I, I know we won't get. I don't see this getting done, and I don't want it done. I want it done again. I'd rather do things once and right. But uh, I think we need to start. We can because I don't see. I, I'd be surprised if we would get anything in policy form that if we do decide to make changes, on that, that will be effective until the following school year. But the, the, the 2021 school year, I just don't want to let it slide any further than we have. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Okay, on uh, piggybacking on Mr. Offerman, I'm not sure, but somehow I think Ms. Rowe made a similar uh, suggestion. Actually, what is my favorite school in Baltimore County? I don't know that you want to say that out loud. I can say <laughs> Crossroads because I want one on the west side. But Crossroads actually has a wonderful policy. And I've listened to the students, but it's akin. Weren't you the one that said yeah, something about a pouch? Um, but we, uh, Mr. McMillian and I listened to them not only talk about the policy, why it works for them, how they feel about it. We mm -hmm. talk to teachers about it, how it does everything we want it to do, but it takes them out of harm's way. And even spoke to some of the students who said, uh, who are going back to their schools, of course, home schools, um, how they will hope that they will, peer pressure will not make them do something different. But even though the school might not have that same procedure that they have come up with, Crossroads helps them to figure out what do you do when you're back so you maintain uh, what you got here. But it is just it's real simple. Um, and it's just a great policy. And we just say, as our policy, it's, it's a good rule for the school, but as our policy, no cell phones except for et cetera. And that's what they do with the lunchtime and what happens in a classroom. It's laid out perfectly. So sometimes we uh, try to reinvent the wheel. the wheel and it's mm -hmm. already there. We just need to know what we have, the beauty of our schools like Crossroads that are one on the west side of the county. Yes, and I will just say it was great to be at Crossroads with you and Rod, Mr. Uh, Board Member Rod McMillian for the eighth grade celebration. Yeah, that was fantastic. Ms. Rowe? So on a different topic, it, um, it's come to my attention that at least one school is considering and getting feedback for the implementation of uniforms. And I wanted to know what is our policies on uniforms and enforcing children to wear uniforms. Is that something the principal can decide and implement? Do we have policies? We do not have uniform policies. We have over the years had schools that have certain um, dress standards. Um, and uh, for example, uh, I'm recalling uh, middle school several years ago, uh, the issue being whether or not parents could afford to um, to purchase what was decided as the, the school dress. Um, because we are public schools, we can't prohibit students from attending. So in those situations, we did have um, principals or PTAs purchase clothes for, uh, for students who are unable to do so themselves. But there is not a board policy on uniforms. So. Is it permissible for principals to make a decision that the children will u wear uniforms under our current policies and rules? It's usually not done just by the principal, uh, or at least the times that it's been done. I'm, I'm, 
I haven't been involved in any decisions or had any questions recently, so I'm not sure um, how many schools have any sort of particular dress standard. But usually it's something that the principals solicit um, opinions and input of their parent community um, so that it's not something that is uh, imposed by fiat uh, by the principal or by the, the school administration. Because Deer Park Middle has uh, dress standards where the students wear khakis and then they have different uh, golf type shirts based on which program they're involved in. Ms. Pesture? Yeah, they do it though because it, they have the magnet programs and so they sort of get away with that. We did do it at Old Court that had no magnet programs, but as uh, Mrs. Howie said, uh, the administ was, as administrators, we took ourselves off the hook. It became about the PTA. We had uh, children, student reps as well so that they could talk about what it looked like. They could have real discussion about um, how it took them off, the parents off the hook of how much I have to spend to have something that looks like this, that, and the other. And they um, also talked about how they could make it fashionable, what was acceptable, could you have a scarf, et cetera, what kinds of sweaters or jackets and whatever, all of that, and it worked. And then at Randallstown, we didn't have a un we didn't they didn't wear uniforms, but we did have a dress policy, and um, about what was acceptable. So, in terms of length and all sorts of things, and we shared that uh, always at the ninth grade level, so everyone knew. So you could still wear whatever but you knew what the policy was and or the rule was so that if um, there was an infraction, you knew what that meant. Um, and a parent or whomever knew that they would come up. And the parents actually appreciated it. We weren't real sure, except we didn't want to look at people. We didn't look want to look at bodies. We just wanted them to come to school prepared to do the work. And we had PTA. Um, and community support to uh, open up what we called um, We Have You Covered, which was a closet with appropriate clothes. And um, if you didn't, you had a choice and you could go there. No one wanted to do that, so generally they came appropriately dressed. And that really worked as well. And it was easier on the high school level than trying to do a uniform, per se. Does that address your? I mean, it kind of does. I just want to know who is the person with the authority to actually make the decision? Is it the board? Is it the school? Is it who does this? As I indicated, the, an individual principal does not have the authority to impose um, at least that individual principal cannot do that in order to exclude certain of our students from school if they fail to wear a certain, um, a certain type of dress. Mm -hmm. So it's usually done by consensus when there are particular standards, the khaki pants and the, the polo shirts, uh, for example, and the different color based on program or based on grade. Um, that is ultimately something that is a school community's decision and not an individual principal's decision. It sounds like it's all of your stakeholders in the school together because you open if, if an administrator says this is what we're going to do and the children don't, you don't have a leg on which to stand, and then you create more drama for yourself uh, because you have to figure out then what you're gonna do with the children, how far, who, as a penalty, how far you're gonna carry the penalty. So you really want to have that stakeholder buy-in in your school. What if all the stakeholders don't agree? Then it's probably not gonna happen. That is I bad. see, okay.
middle school to just have certain um, um, guidelines or standards about what it looked like. You know, that's a whole lot simpler than telling folks what to do. Milk is milk, fries are uniform for about one and a half minutes. <laughs> I can see why. Well, I think maybe that's something to think about. So is there any further business? Since there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. I appreciate staff and board members for all that you've done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>